So um, Chris Kokinas, I'm going in alphabetical order, I think. Chris Kokinas is the author of Hope is the Thing with Feathers, A Personal Chronicle of Vanished Birds, and The Fallen Sky, An Intimate History of Shooting Stars. He's also a poet, and with this book, The Underneath, uh, won a New American Poetry Prize, which was published, and the book was published in 2019. With Eric, Eric McGrain, he has also helped to found a new genre, The Literary Field Guide, guide and it's wonderful. It's the Sonoran Field Guide. It, it's a beautiful book. Among other prizes and honors Kokinas has earned are a Whiting Foundation Award, the Glasgow Prize for an Emerging Writer, an NSF Antarctic Visiting Artist and Writer Fellowship, two publication grants for Isotope from the NEA, the Sigurd Olson Nature Writing Award, a Kavli Fellowship for Science Communication Training, a Journalism and Media Fellowship from UCLA's Institute for the Environment and Sustainability, a Southwest Book Award with co-editor Eric McGrain, and a fellowship from the Rachel Carson Center at Lud Ludwig Maximilian University. University in Munich. Danielle Dubrowski is a long-time long -time resident of Cedar City in Iron County. She's received her PhD in creative writing from the University of Utah and an <laughs> MA in English creative writing from Stanford University. She's the author of Ruin and Light, winner of the 2014 Anabiosis Press Chapbook Competition and of Invisible Shores, a limited edition letterpress folio published through Red Butte Press. An associate professor of creative writing at Southern Utah University. She's taught there since 1990, where she directs the Grace A. Tanner Center for Human Values. She's also the director of an annual fall creative writing conference on eco poetry and the essay. Kimberly Johnson is a poet, translator, and scholar of early modern literature. Her fourth collection of poetry, Risk, is forthcoming from Persia Books. She's also published book-length translations of major poems from antiquity, including the Georgics of Virgil, which was published as part of the landmark Penguin Classic series in 2009, and Hesiod's two great poems of the seventh century BCE, Theogony and Works and Days, which were released in a single volume by Northwestern University Press. With her spouse, Jay Hopler, also a poet, Johnson edited Before the Door of God, an anthology of devotional poetry, which surveyed the development of religious verse from antiquity to the present day. She's received art awards and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the NEA. She's also had held visiting fellowships at the Tanner Humanities Center at the University of Utah and at the American Academy in Rome. Author of several books of poems, Nancy Takax is Takax, sorry, is an emerita professor at USU Eastern CEU. She teaches poetry workshops privately and for community uh, communities of writers. She began a memory cafe in 2019 for poetry lovers who have memory loss, and for several years has taught a weekly poetry workshop to poets of all ages at the Carbon County Senior Center. She's currently the inaugural poet laureate of Helper City, Utah. Her book, The Warrior Poems, received the 2016 Juniper Prize for Poetry, the 2018 Fifteen Bites Book Award for Poetry, and was a finalist for the National Poetry Series. And her other book, Blue Patina, was awarded the 2016 Fifteen Bites Book Award for Poetry. So welcome, all of you. Um, and I would like to kind of talk about why I chose that video um, as an opening for our conversation today. Not only was I very interested in that poem, but I was thinking um, when we're talking about a poem about the environment, we might have, especially with Utah, we probably have ideas about um, Utah's particular writing scene, you know, art, artists and writers like Wallace Stegner, Edward Abbey, Amy Irvine, you know, Ellen Malloy, Bernard DeVoto, right? These are some of the big names. But we also have two big cowboy literature conferences that take place in Utah each year as well. And um, the environment and land is a huge part of their conversation as well. It's a very big part of their creative practice. But maybe when we're thinking about um, eco-poetry and in writing about the environment, we might not be thinking in this particular vein. So I'm curious, let's just go around. We could start with, we'll start with Chris because alphabetizing. Um, what is a poem about the environment, uh, what traditions feed into that? How long does it go back? Who does it include? Who might it not include? So Chris, take that away. Um, yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I think Kim might be uh, the person to, to trace it back to, a, to its deepest roots in, in, in Western literature. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the oldest, the oldest story in, in the Western canon is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it includes, it, it includes an act of, um, of uh, uh, environmental destruction. You know, the, the protagonists uh, take down the, the, the forests, the cedar forests and 
So, you know, it, this, uh, the, the fraught re- and, and the, um, you know, the relationship, uh, if, you, if you don't know the story of, of Gilgamesh, it's, it's wonderful and it, it's all there. Everything's there, desire and fear and uh, death, uh, hubris. Um, and so those themes are already embedded, I think. Um, and, it, it, you know, more recently, I, at least from my perspective, um, uh, the the kind of, uh, of, of tradition, I guess, that, that I was sort of steeped in um, for a long time was a kind of, um, you know, white middle-class moralistic tradition. Uh, and, and I've come to see some very deep problems and limitations with that. Although, you know, writers of, of tremendous, you know, tremendous beauty and, and have, you know, uh, people like Wendell Berry, for example, outside of the Utah, you know, landscape. Um, so it's a big question. Um, and I would just add a couple things. Um, one is I love that line, a desperate kind of stub- stubborn uh, in, in that poem. Um, and and, and it, it brought forward the need to think about labor. Yeah work of actually being um, on on the land uh, in in the kind of economy that we're we're stuck with for the time being and so I, I thought it was a, a really nice sort of bearing witness to, to that um, and the other the other thing I just want to say just sort of selfishly is like it's great to be back I uh, <laughs> we, uh, you know I was at Utah State for 10 years I'm still teaching at the University of Arizona um, but we found uh, my my wife and I found a, a, our sort of dream early retirement house in Salt Lake. And so uh, this feels a little bit like uh, it is. It's like a, a literary homecoming and the sort of openness and friendliness and, and uh, excellence of the Utah literary community. Um, it's just great to be back. So, um, yeah. And I've, I have some other thoughts I can share, but I want to hear from everyone else, too. Yeah. Does anyone else want to leap in? We can go. Okay, well, yeah, yeah. Can I pick up on this theme of work that Chris has introduced to us? I mean, I think that many of us, when we when we contemplate environmental writing, we our, our minds first go to the kind of inheritance of the romantic tradition, this kind of sublime engagement with something that exceeds our apprehension uh, and comes to stand in a kind of enlightenment way, stand in for the divine. Like I'm having this encounter mm-hmm. with thing that is that makes me feel small and makes me feel insignificant and uh, and in in an increasing age of such an, an age of increasing secularization uh, the the nature comes to stand for the kinds of humbling or uh, or expansive experiences that were once the province of uh, religious participation but I think that the that Chris correctly identifies that um, nature poetry from its from its uh, most ancient expressions uh, requires the kind of labor that is involved if you are participating in the land, not just observing it for, as an outsider, somebody upon whom nature is magnificently working, but you are working together. So uh, the two texts that I've translated, actually, I pick them in part because I'm interested in environmental writing. And they're both instances of ancient conceptions of interaction with the environment. One is Hesiod. Uh, the, Hesiod has two poems uh, from the ancient world. One of them is Theogony, and it's a little less involved with, uh, with the natural world, except insofar as it is concerned with the, with the making, the coming into being of the natural world. But his works and days is really very much a practical set of ruminations about uh, participation in the land and in the landscape. And then Virgil's Georgics, the title Georgics comes from two Greek words, meaning to work the land. Mm -hmm. Um, And it is a four book poem about different kinds of agricultural practices. One is, one book is involved with ranching, one book is involved with with, uh, grapes and viticulture. One book is involved with uh, the raising of honeybees, and then one book is involved with grain crops. And he's not, like, he doesn't, Virgil doesn't register that kind of romantic sublime. He's a very practical and clear-eyed re- um, representation of a, a kind of a, a daily quotidian uh, participation in what the land offers. So I think that, I, I also think, that that was a perfect poem to begin this conversation with, Paisley. 
Danielle, it looks like you were going to say something. Great. I'll just add to that. I, um, I, I love that we're, we're kind of inspired by the lines from that poem because what I wrote down was beneath a battered brow that shows his view. And when I consider a poetry about the environment, to me, it's a strong connection to place, a personal connection to place. And you write in the language of that place so that you do write having lived there, worked there, understanding the, the, uh, the, 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 um, the natural, the plants, the trees, the, lang the actual um, existence of what is there, the biological existence that is there. And then also when I consider landscape, we shape landscape with our words. And so as we're writing a poem about a place, um, it's you know, how we see it, is, is what, but it also shapes us. The landscape shapes, shapes our own perception and our, and our own connection to that. And so there were so many areas in that poem that there was a sense of that connection to land, personal connection, using the language of the place and also that notion of labor. And I think that there's, with environmental poetry, there is that kind of duality of writing about the place but not really living in it <laughs> necessarily, writing mm -hmm. about it from a distance or writing about it from memory. It's a place that meant something to you, but you're no longer there. So you write about it in memory or you're deeply rooted in it and, and sustained by it. And you write about it from that perspective. So I think those are some different, different aspects for environmental poetry. Before going to Nancy, I wanna draw attention to one of Chris's comments that was put in the chat. Art theorists talk about how much, how much you must have the means to avoid labor on the land to experience landscape, which I think is getting to the heart of something that you're talking about too, you know, Danielle, which is that it's not just labor, but you know, money is sort of built in potentially mm -hmm. implicitly to this discussion of, you know, a kind of environmental poetry, like what gets classified as environmental poetry versus maybe something else, or the ways we might have to actually consider the ways that money and labor actually really do shape these practices. Nancy, what do you what are your thoughts on these, any of these topics so far? <laughs> well, going back to uh, what Danny said about um, changing uh, or interacting with the landscape, interacting and being changed by it or becoming the landscape while you're inside that particular landscape and the landscape becomes you. Um, I, I live near the San Rafael Swell, so it's really easy for me to get out into the desert. And there's that sense of renewal um, and that idea of slow change that overcomes me. Um, so physically, you know, the erosion by natural forces makes it starkly yet colorfully um, wonderful and surprising. Um, and uh, many times you're completely alone um, and so uh, if, if you want to find solitude, it's there. And I often do do that because it's so close. And for me, um, as a poet, hiking is, you know, it's a bodily act uh, that connects me with the path, um, meditation, uh, inner dialogue, the desire for wandering. And, um, and uh, by the end of the day, I am part of the landscape. Um, that uh, I, I also get the feeling of, you know, to complicate things, um, it's easy to get lost there. And, um, and I've been lost there a few times. Um, and <laughs> there's an overall feeling of loss. Uh, it's ancient people, it's geological history that's formed depressions and risings and what's left from the great seas and, uh, Jung believed uh, the natural world is important to us as a spiritual guide and connects us through our hands-on experiences in it uh, to the collective unconscious. And uh, going back to poetry, it, since poetry leans on archetypes, um, I think it's important to us as writers. Um, the natural landscape, wherever it is that you're writing about, is inside us. You know, trees, moons, paintbrush, globe mallow, water stories um, they're inside us and waiting to become poetry that's unique um, because of our take on it and what we are going through at the time um, while keeping in mind what we share with other with everyone else one of the things that really strikes me about your comment and it's something that's bubbling under the the, the conversation we're already having is does can 
does the eco poem or does the environmentally aware poem at some level always center the human or does it decenter it? I, in a weird way, I want to go back to Chris's uh, comment in the chat, the sublime in the 18th century arises in part of the, in the European tradition because money allows for leisure to travel and the possibility of encountering previously neglected landscapes as inspiring, such as the Alps. Travelers used to shutter their carriages while traveling in the Alps because the mountains were seen as grotesque, even so. <laughs> I mean, one of the difficulties is, of course, writing a poem, you know, we are the human producers of this poem, so it's almost impossible to decenter the human. But when we're talking about some of the environmental literary tropes is coming out of this idea of, you know, the sublime and personal transformation and change, is there an eco poetry that can somehow decenter the human or unsettle it in some useful ways? I, I, I would just briefly weigh in and say, <clears throat> um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, it's a, you know, it, it's a, mm, it's a, a, a beautifully and usefully impossible question to answer. Um, but, you know, uh, the poet Robinson Jeffers has a line and, you know, in many lines that sort of iterate off of this, you know, we must uncenter our minds from ourselves. And, you know, he's interested in, in what he calls inhumanism, or we might call them, you know, the more than human um, and so I think those efforts to, to do that are, are worthwhile, whether he accomplished it or, you know, David Lee has accomplished it, you know, or whomever, it's, it's hard to say, but just seeing poets in the act of trying to, to um, invest their, um, their aesthetic selves and their psyches and even just the, you know, um, aspects of language and the techniques of, of craft uh, in the service of the other and the you know the in a kind of I thou relationship I think is 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 worth is worth seeing and pursuing, and I think there are poets who are you know more successful at that than others. Kim, you look like you're about to say yeah, something. I, I feel skepticism, and I will tell you why I feel skepticism, um, because once you're committing uh, once once you're committing to the page and to language, you are participating in the literary, and the literary is irreducibly human. So you can like try to remove the self as much as possible, but the act of perception that you're recording in language is human perception. perception. So I'm not sure it's possible to decenter the, the human in writing about nature. It kind of reminds me of, uh, this, is, this is forecasting the later conversation from another excellent panel uh, later on today about devotional writing. Um, you know, there's a long tradition of people trying to write to God and to erase themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not possible to do that once you are like asserting, doing the self-assertion of, uh, of committing yourself to language. So I just think that's, I think it's a, uh, a conundrum that is provocative to writers, but it may not be possible in practice just by virtue of the mechanics of the system of language. Danielle, looks like you're about to, yeah. Yeah, I, I do think that poetry is unique in its, in, in when we read a poem, to me, it naturally centralizes, cent centers our mind in a way that we don't expect, in a way that, that um, you, it's sort of like, to me, I feel like it's, it works as a speed of lightning or speed of light, where suddenly it brings something together, um, almost like the nucleus of a cell. So I just, I, I do feel like, I, I, I agree that I don't, I don't think it's possible to decenter to our, in our reading of it. But I do think there are poets who try to do as much as they can. There are some poets who, who, who try to, to take that sense of themselves out, if that's possible, where yeah. it's just image, 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 but it is still their perception. And then once you read that, your perception interacts with it and it creates its own kind of um, communication. So, so I, I, we may try to decentralize, but I don't think it's possible to do that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, Nancy? Well, that's not what interests me in environmental writing. I mean, that's, I, I, I like uh, that idea of perception and I think it's needed, so I agree. You know, in a way it goes, uh, there's a question in, in the Q&A from Georgia. Uh, if we live on the land, if we just come into it for meditation or rejuvenation, are we not using the land? The uses may be different, but don't we expect the land to sustain us? And I, I think that in a, in a strange way that might connect with something you just said there, Nancy, which is, you know, that is, you know, I, I don't expect the environmental poem to, to, to somehow decenter the human, that this is, this is the work of 
the poem, potentially this is also the work of the land. But I want to go and return to something that uh, Danielle was talking about. You know, even if we can't decenter it, one of the poets that I invited also to be part of the panel who could not make it was Laura Tohi, who's a Navajo poet. Um, but I want to read very briefly one of her poems that's on Mapping Literary Utah. Nice plug for the site, which I'll put in the chat. But this is called Japanese Garden after a stone and sand exhibit in Portland. A man is leading the animals. A man is leading the ones that float on water. A man is leading the winged ones. A man is leading the ones that swim. Maybe he's St. Francis, the long robed man who calls the animals to him now. Maybe he's Noah, the one who gathered the animals and sailed away with them. Let me see if I can, oh dear, sailed away with them. <laughs> who was there to witness their leaving, to sing a song for their journey? Where are they going? Their faces turn northward, taking their songs, taking their maps, taking their languages. One of the things that I like about that poem is that it certainly doesn't decenter the human, but it certainly leaves a big question open to what the language is of these animals. And when they go, we don't have access that, to that anymore. And I'll put that in the chat. But that, that, that was an interesting way of not necessarily decentering the human, but you know, certainly thinking about, is there a limitation to human knowledge of the land? And what does that look like? I'm going to go to some questions that are popping up here in the Q&A. Unless, I'm oh, sorry, did somebody want to say something about Chris? I, I just want to very briefly say one, one I, I completely agree with everything that's being said here, but I th one of the things that, that I think um, poets um, and, and scientists, other writers, uh, artists can do is in, engage us in, in, and this is where the Utah landscape, of course, is, is wonderful for this project of engaging in deep time. Uh, we're biased to the present, we're biased to the visible present. It's just sort of how we've evolved. Um, and so any work that sort of takes us into other, um, you know, other times, other geologic eras, uh, I, I find, you know, it is despite the human centeredness of language, of course, um, you know, is, is one way of a, a little, at least a little bit decentering us from the moment that we're in. I want to talk about, um, I'm going to go to the Q&A because there's some great questions that are showing up here. So this is from Catherine. What is the role of the eco poem in an era of unprecedented environmental catastrophe? How does poetry grapple with human belonging to nature as well as the need for conservation away from human development? <laughs> with that in mind, I'd like to tack on one more thing that makes it even more difficult. When we're thinking about an eco poem, are we actually talking about a poem that has a politi politi um, excuse me, particular political or ethical trajectory now in the age of the Anthropocene. Anyone want to take that? It's only 12 o'clock. <laughs> Any part of those questions? The question was so dense, I feel like I need to return to it so I can see. Let me, let me um, you can click on the Q&A, but let's just take yeah. the first part of that because the first part is really, what is the role of the eco-poem in this era of unprecedented environmental catastrophe? I got, I got something, I got yeah. something. Um, so there's this book that I'm a little evangelical about. It's <laughs> called Shallow Water Dictionary by uh, an author. I can never remember the, whether his first name is John or Robert, but it doesn't matter. His last name is Stilgo, S-T-I-L-G-O. Oh, John Stilgo. Thank you. The John Stilgo Shallow Water Dictionary. And it's this lovely little essay, uh, book length essay. And it's a, it, it, it takes you through the estuary region of, um, of New England and kind of points out features and language that has fallen out of use in, uh, in our English discourse. And at the end of the book, uh, you should still read it. I'm, this is not a huge spoiler. I'm just telling you kind of what, the, what his thesis uh, turns out to be. He, he argues that if we don't have language for what we observe, then we don't see it. Uh, and so one potential response to the question of what is the role of poetry in this moment of ecological fragility is to, uh, is to train people to see what they might overlook otherwise. Because once you uh, see something, uh, you can start to comprehend it. Once you co comprehend it, you gain a greater stake in investing in its well-being. I think that goes back to Chris's comment in the chat about uh, why we privilege the pine, the pine over the bark beetles. In part, it's because of evolution, and in part, it's because our discourse elevates the pine over the bark beetles, right? We've learned to see pines 
in a, in a particular linguistic way that we don't see uh, bark beetles, so. Danielle. <laughs> Just gonna put a shout out for another collection which I think is helpful, it's called um, Ghost Fishing, an Eco-Justice Poetry Anthology, and it's edited by Melissa Tucky and with a foreword by Camille Dun Dungy. And I, um, I, I think that for me, what eco-poetry does is help us to understand our own connections to a place. So if we, through, through a poet's connection or through a poet's writing of that place, become more aware of that's the, so the surroundings, the environment, then I think it, it, it helps our, you know, our own decisions. How are we going to live in that place? What's going to be our interaction with that place? So that's how I see one aspect of eco-poetry bringing um, a voice or an awareness of, of that of place. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanna go to um, this question that was put into the chat. So Matthew writes, the problem of the human centric aside, what political or philosophical ideas do you think that it's important for the eco poem to challenge? That was sort of one of my questions too, which is do we assume even that the eco poem has a political stance or a particular set of values embedded in it? Going back to the video that opened this panel, like would most people imagine that a rancher's poem is in fact an eco critical, an eco poem or something? But you know, what are, the philosophical or value systems that uh, that an eco poem might challenge usefully. I might suggest that one principle that an eco poem could cha challenge is the idea that an eco poem is something about nature. Yeah, writing about nature. What poem isn't an environmental poem? Can yeah. you conceive of any poem that doesn't? take place in or respond to an environment. Uh, I think that the, it might be, uh, it might drive unnecessary divisions to suppose that an environmental poem uh, has to maintain a certain kind of politics, has to maintain a certain kind of vision of the land, um, often derived from that kind of post-romantic, post-enlightenment uh, reverence for the land. But I can't, I don't even, it's funny to me that, uh, that we don't recognize Frank O'Hara as writing environmental poetry yeah. Yeah. Um, when his poetry is steeped in the environment of its writing, right? So uh, I think that that's one, one uh, puzzle that the environmental poem can help us to, uh, to solve is the privileging of uh, it, it, it allows us to see that, worth, that which is worth conserving as out there somewhere, mm. rather than investing in what's here. Which is interesting because, of course, I can think of a lot of African-American poets who write very richly of the, their neighborhood life. I'm thinking of, yeah. you know, Hoops by Major Jackson. I'm thinking about some of Joshua Bennett's work. And, you know, like there's a lot of people who are writing... Uh, in, Gwendolyn Brooks wrote tremendously about yeah. her Chicago neighborhoods, right? Yeah. But this idea that somehow that that is not in a place, that is not an environmental poem, I think is an excellent one. So, you know, we're back to this question of, is there an implicit, you know, there's an implicit question about economics and labor. Is there a question implicitly about race even too? But Chris, yeah. Yeah, no, this is all really good and, and gets at, you know, one of the things that has, um, has troubled me for many years and that is the sort of uh, you, the, the question was, you know, uh, ideas, <clears throat> ideas you think it's important for the eco poem to challenge. Um, I think one of one of the ideas or one of the um, uh, stances that the best poetry about our relationship with the non human uh, should challenge is um, its own anger. Uh, which has a sort of limited, I think, aesthetic and political efficacy. Um, and most especially, it should own its own complicity. Uh, and so um, I think that, the, that the, the moment that we're in right now has, has made it very clear that we are all enmeshed in this and that the, um, uh, the illusion, you know, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere uh, makes it clear that that the illusion that we are somehow separate from anything is just BS. And so we need to own our own complicity in our work, whether it's poetry, um, our own activism, 
what have you. Yeah. Nancy, did you have any thoughts about this that you'd like to add? Well, you, you raised a question about um, political. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll raise the question about, do we have a responsibility mm -hmm. to write poetry about what's happening um, with climate change and the loss of, you know, 50% of our species of animals and uh, how do you feel about that? I'll ask the rest of the group that question. Um, That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that we do. I think that um, a term that I consider is a term solastalgia, and it's a term that was coined by a psychologist, I believe his last name is Albrecht. I can't think of the first name. But solastalgia is kind of a, a reverse of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. About, it refers to a place that has changed because of other and other factors, environmental factors usually. So you go back to a place that once was open and now it's been developed and uh, just in, in simplistic terms. So going back to what Chris was saying about this notion of deep time, if you live in a, if you live in a, in a landscape that is surrounded by evidence of that deep time, but also at the same time, things are changing so quickly, so rapidly, we're losing so much within, with, again, beyond some things beyond our control, that what Nancy said, in a way, eco-poetry can be a poetry of witness. And it's also a, through a poetry of witness, um, and Kimberly, what you're saying too, is that poets who live in urban areas, poets who live in the cities, are also poets of witness of their environment. What's changing there? How, how have they shaped it? How has it shaped them? So th this is going back to this notion of, of an ecosystem that it is, it is all very much connected and maybe more so now than ever. Perhaps before there was a luxury, if there's a luxury of saying, well, I'm just gonna write about what I see in front of my hill and that, <laughs> that'll be it. But, but we know, I don't think there's that luxury anymore. And I think that Nancy's poems have, you've confronted that with, I think with the warrior poetry, your, your book. I think one of your, your poems is pl about plastic and, and just the poem about what is, I mean, I think it just addresses that. And so I, I, so I do think poet, poets of poetry of witness would be connected to eco-poetry and what's happening now. What's so interesting about this conversation and the comments that you guys are um, presenting here is that um, there's sort of two ecosystems inherent to the eco-poetry, right? There's the ecosystem that gets uh, seen and witnessed by the human observer. But then there's, of course, the ecosystem that composes the observer, the labor, the racial um, uh, background, potentially, the sort of economic web, um, you know, that we've been talking about, the ways in which that person's able to access spaces in different ways. And so it's almost like the meeting of two different ecosystems at one point in time. I want to take a second to just sort of, ch you know, shout out some of the things that are occurring in the chat, because people are throwing out some fantastic um, other books to take a look at. And I don't know if other people are looking at the chat, but, you know, um, Sand County Almanac, which I have to admit, the first time I read it by Aldo mm -hmm. Leo, I was just like, oh, the squirrels, I don't care about your squirrels. But it was, so it was enlightening to me because I realized that, again, my idea of uh, a, a nature book or a book that was going to be considering environment was one that was going to have to be far flung. You go to an exotic and potentially life threatening kind of experience that you then you experience nature, not, you know, you're just looking at your yard and you're looking at the magpies and the squirrels. But yeah, ghost fishing is a wonderful anthology. Ross Gay writing about the backyard garden. And, you know, Ross Gay is another excellent example of that, right? You know, thinking about, you know, he's somebody who's been deeply invested in urban landscapes and, and gardens and things like that. And, um, and, and, and writing about those spaces. Colors of Nature, um, an anthology by Alison Hawthorne Deming. Which is uh, excellent about human history in the U.S. and the environment, and then the trouble with wilderness by William Cronin, which I'm going to have to check out as well. Um, I want to excuse me, uh, Abundant Earth by Eileen Christ, fabulous. Okay, great. Abundant Earth by Eileen Christ, and if you want to write that in the chat, you're welcome to. I'm going to go back to a question that Brenda is asking. And this is a, a long one, so you may want to pull it up in the Q&A uh, panelists. I'm really interested in the line being drawn here between labor and environment yep. and how that affects aesthetic experience. I'm wondering if poetry can necessarily be considered environmental, maybe because it has a distinctly 
distinct thread of human history, et cetera, really could be productively viewed this way. I'm thinking of Rukeyser's Book of the Dead in particular. This seems to me a deep investigation of the environment almost to a particulate level, silica. Yeah, literally silica. But that also perhaps investigates how environmental and human exploitation are often inextricable. Going back to those yeah. two ecosystems meeting and imperative. Chris, it looks like you've got yeah. some stuff to say. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, that's great. I, I, I looked at that question earlier and Rukeyser's Book of the Dead is, is, I think, a wonderful example of that. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say as, as this conversation was unfolding um, is that um, it may be sort of a self-correction too. It's like not every poem has to do everything. Right? Yeah. If I'm arguing for our work to own our own complicity, that, you know, there, there's, there's still plenty of room for, you know, the Mary Oliver poem that's just looking at a heron, you know, or, or a poem of, of Ken Brewer's that's, you know, just talking about fishing. Um, and so it's really, I think, the whole body of the work that a writer is bringing to this uh, moment that, you know, we, we, we can be talking about. You know, I was thinking about- Yeah, Ben Gunsberg's mentioning A.R. Ammon's uh, book, Garbage, which is oh, yeah. a pioneering yeah. book as Rukeyser's was too in that way. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I was thinking one of the criticisms of Ross Gay's work, as much as, you know, I love it too, a lot of people are like, well, this is just praise poems and does that make it too easy? But I think that's a great point, Chris, that not every poem has to do every single thing, right? That's, it's, we're talking about a, an eco-literature, not a, a, a single poem. Kim, did it look like you were going to say something too? Or? Uh, just agreeing with everything that has been said. <laughs> Big <laughs> agreement. <laughs> Nancy, were you going to say something? Nope. <laughs> I'm just <Yeah. laughs> picking on people. So I want to move to Melody, uh, Melody's question here. Naive as this question may be, I'm curious. In your experience, are poets as a group more or less concerned with politics of environment and conservation than the average citizen? Are we or are humans diverse enough that poets like others cover a wide range of such concerns? That's kind of like what Chris was talking about this last uh, in his answer to the last question, right? Um, that there are, uh, there are as many ways of inhabiting a poem as there are poets. There are as many ways of inhabiting an environment as there are poets. And that should be heartening to us, I think, to get the, to get the diversity of voices uh, and to start to uh, think <laughs> like collaboratively across the human community about the ways that these perspectives interact with one another. I think that... Uh, think that that's crucial. I will ask a question though that's even maybe more regionally specific. I mean we are in Utah and this is all about Utah poets. Do you think that there is something, a particular um, weight placed on Utah poets interested in this kind of work considering that in our state um, environmental spaces are very contested. Um, we can talk about bears ears. We can talk about the fact that our governor just said he was going to sue the federal government if, if Biden went ahead and, and unilaterally, as he said, uh, widened the borders of the Grand Escalante and bears ears. So does, is there a connection specifically about Utah poetry and place? And I'm just curious for those of you I feel like I'm just asking these gobstopping stopper questions. <laughs> I do. I, I think that, of course, you know, I, I agree that um, it's there, it's near us. It's, um, and it's part of what we hear every day in the news. And it's, um, I think that poets do feel uh, more connected to the land. I mean, just people do in this area, um, in the, in the whole state, um, because of, you know, what we get to see, what we get to experience that other people don't. I mean, I know I know, I talk to people back East that uh, poets who are constantly raising questions about what the heck is that? And <laughs> you don't have purple mustard, it's yellow. And um, so I think that um, maybe we're a little bit more aware um, as a group of poets, um, as poets. I think that if you decide at some point, when you decide poetry is what you're going to follow, whether it's aesthetically, professionally, whatever, however, you've already chosen an, an, a, an art that is, comes back to focus. 
It's one that, that focuses on detail, small spaces, small, you know, smaller ex experiences, I guess. At least that's for me. I'm just speaking for myself, but it, it, it it's, it's, has that sort of focus intent. So, so when you're living in a place that you do feel connected to, it is those small details that might call, atten might call your attention. And I think that just aesthetically, that, that focus is part of what it, you know, connects us in some ways to the land. And that's, and I, and from my perspective, I came from Virginia. I grew up in another landscape altogether mm -hmm. and, and really literally lost that landscape because of family dynamics, a death in the family. My father died when I was 18. And so that landscape was, was gone as I understood it and I could never go back to it. So that, that kind of loss of landscape is what I carried into the current landscape for Utah. And as Utah began to unfold to me, that it's as its beauties began to unfold and the Virginia landscape began to maybe meld with it or recede a little bit, then, then there was almost a healing process in that for me from, from that sense of loss between those landscapes. So I, going back to this idea of, of you know, how do Utah poets connect with the land and with the poem that we started, it's, it is a way of preserving maybe what we, what we, um, what we fear we're going to lose. And it's going back to the advocacy for for yeah. land, for bear deers, for the Escalante, for what we what those of us who live in Utah and interact with the land in a variety of ways, we know what kind of, what can be lost from that. So that may be where the strength of our language comes from. I have a quick question for you, Danny. How did it take you quite a while then to be able to because I know you're very connected to landscape and place in your work, um, did you feel that it took quite a while for you to be able to you to, I hate to say use, but you know, uh, have, have imagery uh, from Utah come into your poems? Yeah, it was like about 10, 15 years. It was a long time because it was a long time of, 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 of just sort of um, not losing the connection to the one landscape, but but acknowledging that what I have is, is as much as powerful as what I had. And uh -huh. so, so that, so I'd say, but it did take a, it was a process and a mm -hmm. process of writing and incorporating the, the Southern landscape mm -hmm. in the Southwest landscape. And then eventually seeing the Southwest landscape for what it is mm -hmm. instead of for what I was missing that it didn't have. Right. Uh -huh. It takes time to develop a relationship Mm -hmm. with the yeah. land feel like it knows us and we have the right to write about it mm -hmm. yeah Kim. the term relationship that you just used nancy is so important because it bespeaks something about that the bi-directionality of our participation in the world around us and also you know that that sense of familiarity that sense of uh comfort and um uh an investment that Many of us come to feel, I mean, I, unlike Danielle, uh, I grew up in Utah. I have, you know, my father's family ran sheep over the mountains of central Utah, and I'm named after a mountain in Utah. So, like, it's, it's as close to DNA material, the landscape, the land of Utah, um, as I can imagine it being. And I think that that, that, that I, uh, that whether, I am perpetually writing poems about, you know, explicitly about the environment. I think it's inevitable that this environment which has, with which I have a long relationship informs my perspective, in, informs the things I'm going to see and informs the things I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. You want to, I want to, point out a few things that are coming out via the chat. First of all, um, Richard has said, check out the place that inhabits us, Palms of the San Francisco Bay watershed, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many places have their eco literary systems too. And so thank you for the uh, recommendations is uh, really great. But Chris also writes, you know, in Utah, the conjunction of public lands contested politics over that and the sheer sublime diversity of that land, a function of deep time serves a as a great catalyst for literary and artistic work of all kinds, right? And and activism that, you know, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, Terry Tempest Williams and, and Brooke, you know, that have done a tremendous amount of activism and are both, you know, big parts of um, the literary landscape and Tory House Press, right? That, that comes out around 
this particular, um, you know, all these catalysts of these different types of landscapes. But it's true also, if you think about Utah as a place that makes its money off its lands, um, five national parks, best snow on earth, you know, for a while we had the outdoor retailers. I don't think any of us can actually extricate ourselves either economically or physically from the, the landscape and what that means. Um, and salt, shout out to Salt Front as well, right? But also, I mean, I, you know, I grew up in Seattle and I lived in, you know, places all over the world, but then spent the most amount of time in Seattle and Utah and in Wyoming sort of consistently. So I've lived my entire life in the West, but of course, these are very different Wests and very different ideas of West and shaped by so many different forces. So even when we're thinking about writing about the West, um, you know, what, where, are the, where are the boundaries of West <laughs> for you, um, if there are any? Huh. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can't figure it out myself. <laughs> yeah. We were just saying. Sorry. Go ahead, I was just thinking about how when I finished my PhD program, the advisors uh, who were in charge of encouraging us to apply for jobs were very upset when I said I was not going to apply to any job that was further west than the Sierra Nevadas or further east than the Mississippi River. I had no interest in being beyond those boundaries. <laughs> And meanwhile, the coasts have no idea we even exist. <laughs> yeah. Chris? Well, I, I, yeah, just very briefly to say, you know, sort of um, having been up in Logan for 10 years and then 10 years in Tucson and in that time also coming back to a cabin in Logan Canyon, now, you know, the sort of like partial relocation in Salt Lake and having to go back to Tucson and like I am just living this, you know, the difference is like Tucson to us is very different, um, you know, even from like the Arizona Strip and Kanab and, and that area, and very different from the Wasatch. And one thing we haven't talked about is like seasons and like the variability of weather and how that really affects um, your your sense of your sense of place. Um, and and of course is tied directly to climate change as extreme weather events um, you know unfold. And it's not great anywhere, but it's it's awful in, in Southern Arizona. And so that, you know, coming back to some of the things that Nancy and, and Danny were saying in particular about the time and bearing witness to it, like having that sort of weight all the time in Tucson um, can be a little hard to carry. Yeah. We have <laughs> time, room for one more question, but I actually want to leave it up to you guys because I asked if you wanted to share a poem. We, can, we have enough time to either go around Robin and share a poem that you might think would speak to any of the subjects that we brought up today, or we could just take one more question. But um, I would personally love it if you read a poem so we could kind of close out the hour, hour with poetry too. All right, poetry. So um, Nancy, can we start with you actually? This poem is called The Worrier. See, I was ready. <laughs> uh, the Worrier Failure. And uh, the reason why I chose it is um, because it, it, it speaks to uh, the landscape in, uh, in and around the San Rafael Swell. Where is the point of it? A hoodoo in Goblin Valley, the hanging garden above Jackass Bench. Where did it begin? Millions of years ago, the pastel sweep of earth, an anticline that used to be a sea, Baptist draw that says wilderness in a bullet-ridden signpost. Where are you? A thousand feet up on a ledge without a guardrail, near caldera explosions, domes capping sediment, lavender figures, a veil of stones. In the seas, bathtub rings where I can still feel the ripples. Where does failure come from? Trilobites, corals, dinosaur footprints, ice-aged mammoths. How do you get rid of it? I'm learning not to trust the map. Instead, I take the turn to Devil's Canyon, bypass the old uranium mine, a hawk circles to get a good look at the cow who has fallen, dead since last spring in the river, his head alive with darkness and wings. 
I find Hell's Backbone Trail. I find Swayze's Leap, where Frank bet his brother he could leap a chasm on horseback, the river below. And he did. What do you want? To get lost. Turn the map upside down. Be surprised to find an alcove with a granary and a few bits of corn, black and white pottery shards. Run off to an emerald pool of caddisfly larvae who swim to my toes. Grace. Danielle, I'll just kind of go round robin. <laughs> You're still muted. <laughs> Just realized that. Um, going to read this poem from Invisible Shores, which is the, the, art, the book that was published by Red Butte Press. And um, just get that to fit. Great Basin. I am no nearer to what the sea tries to loosen, wedged in rock. A sorrow slipped between a trapped metal cap and glass shattered along another coast. The truth is, I don't live near the ocean, but in a desert town I refuse to see, built on alluvial fan of gypsum soil, shifting beneath cracked plaster and skewed door frames, beneath miles of silver sage, rabbit brush, dry lakes, and wind trembling through pinion rooted along the highway. I leave my own trace, planting wisteria, honeysuckle, southern foreigners thirsting for water. I blink and the town is gone, drowned in a sea of fossils. What that sea left behind is the desert I walk through, a sorrow slipped between trilobites and shell. Lovely. Chris, and then we'll end with Kim. Thank you. And just to say thanks to all of all the attendees and the panelists and huge bow of gratitude to Paisley for being such a such a force. Yes. Uh, this is an unpublished poem. I use the word nothing at the end. And by that, I mean the fact of nothing. Um, just so the meaning might be clear. This is called the lenticular clouds. Those are those long, thin clouds um, that you see with high winds up. Uh, <clears throat> over mountains, the lenticular clouds. Your deep grieving made you shallow. The weather was always such and such, but you were gone to having gone a little heated. Eventually, the less you thought you loved, the more you did. Wind sheared curve upon itself, polish and high hover up canyon, a sky doing just what a sky does. You killed the diamond back. You filled its gape with dirt and hushed. Pelicans in spring and August, dragonflies over rasping balsam root and tangy slopes of hot duff and gusts. You're grateful to nothing that makes things tender. Okay, this is called Ash Garden. It's a zero escaping poem. Practical, like Virgil. Ash Garden. Spring begins in a fatness of front lawns, but not mine. I, whose blowtorch urge approaches the ascetic, whose resolve to bury luxuriance grows raw handed from shoveling, have duly torched and shoveled grass until the baked blades crumpled like old palm fronds and their upturned roots drooped. Let spring begin in ash and dust, I say, and bloom as little as possible out of them. I'm planting stone crop and rock mat, and if the fireweed insists on sowing itself in cinders, I'll truckle it to my Lenten aesthetic or pluck it out. I'll parch the ground six weeks to prompt by thirst the fireweed's fancy gratuitous pink to put on the drab. Let it learn in sackcloth colors to thrive on desire alone. It's a discipline I'm ripe to teach. I excel at fasting. 